This is Adjuster TV, Adjusters First. This video is sponsored by Hague Education. Use code Adjuster TV to get a 15% discount on damage assessment, CE training, industry certifications, books, and tools at HagueEducation.com. And by Kaplik. Learn all about E&O and other insurance for adjusters at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. So welcome, my friends. Uh, this is me and Andy Patterson. Um, apparently didn't get the memo. <laughs> For some reason we're matching today. Um, we are in uh, just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I flew down here yesterday to, well, it's supposed to be Sunday, but got some, some delays and whatever, um, to kind of work on some content for Adjuster TV Plus and Adjuster TV and uh, get some things figured out for kind of moving forward with um, some new trainings and what kind of what the rest of the summer is going to look like so we're super stoked about that and uh but we are here to answer your questions and i think uh we kind of wanted to start off with um the question i think somebody had last week that we didn't quite get to is that right so mm -hmm. i think wamba had a question yeah. um so um, I want to make sure that we got the question right. So, Wamba, what was it about again? It's about the ducting wall openings. It was showing zero on uh, his sketch. Okay. Well, let's jump into... Uh... Hey, Wamba. How are you, sir? Yeah, let's jump into Xactimate and just kind of fiddle around with it. So, okay. Um, I think basically the, with the way the question shook out, and you can correct it, correct us if if we're wrong on this, but um, if you're Xactimate asking for some dimensions, and um, you're you've got windows and doors in a room, but those windows and doors don't seem to show up in Xactimate. Yep. So I think uh, Wamba, if we understood your question. Uh, right, you were having some computer issues or computer uh, with Xactimate, and basically, I think uh, you had some wall openings, but it wasn't showing deducted, or I may have that backwards, but it was something to do with the um, showing the on your property showing nothing was deducted for wall openings. So. We can talk about that. Okay, so you found the problem. Okay. Was it just uh, that you didn't uh, have the, uh, like on a missing wall, you didn't have that set to uh, deduct? Is that what it was? So right here it says uh, total wall opening area deducted. And so we've got none. Now, obviously, we do have wall openings here because we have windows, uh, we've got some doors, we've got a missing wall. And so if you want to deduct those, then you can come up here to your options, to your preferences, and then go to your uh, door and window defaults right there. And then you can select really what you want uh, your door and window behaviors along with their missing walls. So right now we don't have anything deducted for doors and windows. Uh, we're deducting missing walls, even if the opening is, um, well, anything over zero is being deducted. So any missing wall that you put on the sketch is automatically going to back that out, back that square footage out for uh, missing walls. So I think we had a, another question in the chat. Let's see what that question was. So yeah, so he asked, uh, where is the linear footage for drift edge in exact mate? Yeah, so that's a good question. So if you go to roof, you can go to your uh, your roof. And you can right click down here on roof and then give you the properties. 
and then go to variables. This is one way to find it. And then a perimeter of roof, which would be your drip. P. P, yeah. See if it has drip. I don't think it does. It should. Uh, no, you're right. Oh, yep. P, yeah. Yeah. So the other way you could do it too. This may be easier. Go to your estimate items and then just uh, go to your roof. And what I'm going to do is just type in RFG drip. And it'll give you the P calculation code or calculation. So it's 250.99, which essentially is the perimeter. So as long as you have a roof on your sketch, you can either find it in properties or variables, or you can just go to your estimate items, act like you're adding drip and do it that way. So another thing that you can do since when we talk about these sub variables, um, you sh should be able to, so go down here to rough, right click, properties, variables, It should show Eve, total Eve length, which again is, you know, for those of you from the Midwest, the Eve's, tro Eve's troughs are the same thing as gutters. And then there should be one for a rake, right? So if you had, sometimes you'll see a house that may have um, on the roof, they might have a uh, drip edge right here but it's on the rakes. And then on the eaves, they might have RFG drip, get, uh, gutter apron on the eaves. This is something you might see every now and then. And that'll split that up. So if you're wondering how, well, you know, the contractor said and pointed it out and it's clearly, you know, they've got drip edge on the, the rakes and gutter apron on the eaves. Um, this is how you would do that. Um, I think for that that kind of that missing wall, or I'm sorry, the uh, oh, what, what do we call it? The 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 deducting for openings. If we go back up for an options preferences, right, and we do, and we we go ahead and. Um, change this door and window defaults. So again, that's under options, preferences, and then down to door and window defaults. Um, if we hit on our window defaults, deduct. So the exam, um, if you haven't taken it yet, it might say uh, to deduct windows from wall calculations, and it'll say if the area is greater than zero square feet. Some carriers will make this like 21 square feet or whatever, but we want to make it for the test zero, right? Um, and then same thing for the doors, the duct, uh, if they're greater than zero, and same thing for the missing wall. So if we created a room here, just for kicks, and we put in a door, a missing wall, and a window, Couple windows or one window, we'll say. Right? This is our little room. We're going to call it Matt's room. This is my room. Um, if we go into our estimate items, And we go to Matt's room and we put in some paint. So we'll just say, just to, just to demonstrate how this works, paint P, walls and ceiling. Right now it's showing 1,028.44, right? If I go back into my sketch, options, uh, preferences, and I turn these off,
hit OK, then if I go back in here, that should have changed, but it didn't change. Maybe delete it and do it again. Let's delete it and do it again. If it's... So it's, it thinks it's 1,028. So we'll do BNTP. BNTP. That's just on a shame. So it's showing the same thing. Hmm. Through the old save and exit. Yeah, I don't think maybe it's maybe it saved it until you went back into it. Which one was that? Um, the Draper. Yeah, Draper, I think. Yeah. So EMTP. Oh no, that's the wrong one. Matt's room. <laughs> I love it when Xactimate backs me up. Still doing it. It's still doing it. Yeah. So that's not correct there. So this is where it gets a little frustrating because you're like, I really want that too. Well, they really can't even see that. Sorry, guys. How about now? Um, maybe it was backwards. So how was everybody's weekend? Interesting. Well, you know, let's do this. Oh, come on, what is it gonna prove? So let's make it easy here so that we can know that we're doing the math right or wrong. So again, listen, this is one of those two o'clock in the morning, um, fiddling around, trying to figure out how to make it work. And you look up and a, a 90 minutes has gone by kind of a deal. It's extra extraordinarily frustrating. So Matt's room, 528. It's just the walls, 340, 384. So 384 is the number we want to try to get the change. I don't know if this is going to work, but. Big doorway. 347. So that changed. What did Not we very do? much, though. 384 to, oh, 384 to 347. Yeah. yeah. And you can get our properties and it'll tell you how much square footage is being deducted. Because that's what the what, what Wamba had on his uh, room properties that's saying total deduction for wall is zero. Where's that one? So a little wall opening, so we got 36.67. So that's what it deducted from yeah. for that door. And again, this is this is for if you're take if you ever want to take the executive level one or two or three tests, this is the kind of thing you're gonna be, you know, fiddling around with. What's up, Kenneth? Um
What else can we work on here? I don't think of what other questions uh, the other group had to test. Oh, yeah, I, just, I put two. Yeah, because that was one we were working on. Oh, that's weird. What's going on there? Oh, it's because. Uh... Yeah, we were show, I was showing them something that. Because <laughs> one of them having a problem putting a door at the top of the stairs. On a floor in the. <laughs> Well, what else can we work on here? Do you guys have any other questions? About anything? Doesn't have to be about Xactimate, certainly. While well, you got us sitting here. You know, something that um, you guys will run into every now and then, and, well, you know what, let's talk about contents for a minute, because I don't think we talk about contents very much. Um, if you are, um, how do I unpin that one? Um, if you're working on a project and you've got, uh, so let's say some patio furniture that has some hail damage to it. You know, hail went straight through the top of the glass top table and all the chairs have glass in them and the little bands that, you know, they took the cushions off because they always take the cushions off with the little straps that hold the, I mean, everybody probably has patio furniture, right? They're, those are busted up and have dings in them or whatever. And Xactimate, unless you've got exact contents and, uh, I don't know that I personally, as a CAD adjuster in particular, would pay for exact contents when you can just do a Google search. Um, so what I would do, you're looking at this patio furniture, right? And the homeowner, I'm going to ask them, I'm going to say, you know, where'd you guys get this? Oh, we got it at, uh, we got it at Walmart uh, three years ago. Right, because you want another age for depreciation, um, and then you may ask them how much they spent on it, and they may or may not remember. And the chances of them having like a, a receipt for something like that is pretty small. Some people do; they're like, "Oh, hold on, let me go look at my lockbox, and I'll pull it out for you." Uh, but not everybody does. Um, so, what you do, and this totally works. It's totally. Um, Is it possible to make that smaller? Mm, I think so. Oh. Whoa, wait, no, no. Um, so what you do is you go to, you can do like, um, if you go to walmart.com, I mean, this is I'm basically showing you guys how to do like an internet search, which is not super duper hard and everybody pretty much knows how to do it, right? But generally, I think the thing that probably works the best is, you know, you could go to Nebraska Furniture Mart, you could go to Wayfair, um, somebody might have Ikea, and you can get the prices up for the, all that stuff, or at least get them in the ballpark. And most, a lot of people these days order stuff, Amazon, right? So you say, okay, well, this is, what is the patio set that they have? It looks pretty much like this, right? $124. That's 
seems like not very much. Does that go for everything? Surely not. Well, whole set though, six piece set. Four chairs, glass top table, and a patio umbrella. Nuts. Maybe a lower quality. But that's where they got it, right? That's the, and this is the exact same. You're looking at the pictures, you're like, that's it. That's the set they have. Then I'm going to put in my, I'm going to go back into Xactimate and um, create a line item. And I'm, I'm maybe, maybe I'll copy this, this stuff, right click, copy, and then I'll hop back over to Xactimate. And, you know, we're in Draper under estimate items. And then I may have a new thing here that's contents. Right. And then I can, there's a couple different ways to do it. You can do USR, a user defined item, and, and just paste that in. And I would put in here price per. Walmart.com, $124, non-OMP, right, well, that, that's what it was, wasn't it? What, 124. 124. Uh, it's a line, it's a homeowner item. I don't know if that makes much difference. Um, I think that's that adding tax. Yep. Um, and then just put some depreciation on there. Probably they said it was three years old. Although you want to do it by percent because it, exactly it has no idea what this is. It doesn't know that it's furniture, so it's not going to know how to depreciate it. So I would say patio furniture optimistically may have a ten-year useful lifespan. And they said it was three years old, so it's 30% depreciation, right? And just do whatever on that and hit OK. So now it's going to depreciate that, and we go look at the estimate. Make sure we're using the final draft with slash without removal depreciation. I don't generally care too much about those. Preview. And then I'm going to go to the right thing here. And find my contents. There it is. Right. So yeah, so then it shows the little description of it, price per Walmart, and then it gets a little bit of depreciation. And probably the thing that I didn't do it's not the right one. is yeah no so it automatically put it as contents so this is one thing you're going to double check um we can get to it here stand by did i close it uh i think you just maybe you should stop sharing and reshare i don't know why it does that so <laughs> we'll get this figured yeah. out. Um, on up now. You can see right here, it automatically, so when you use a USR, a user defined item, it automatically makes it contents. You wanna make sure that this is contents if you're doing a contents item, right? Um, so then when you go to do a, your print preview, which you should always do, just always to double check.
Um, we'll scroll down to our summary pages, right? So you have a summary for dwelling, which is where your deductible probably is going to be if it's, you know, if that makes sense for the claim. And then you have a summary for contents. And there is our uh, patio furniture set, minus plus tax, minus depreciation. So that the, the net claim, so they get 92 bucks. And then once they replace the patio furniture, then they just need to submit their receipt to their agent or to the claim center, and they'll get that extra 39 bucks. So they can be reimbursed for their replacement cost. Uh, Patty furniture. Makes sense? Whoa. Good idea. Okay, so Sherry says, I have been applying to multiple I firms. Seems like everyone has of them has required training, some of our extension, extensive training. Um, how do I choose which one to do the training on first with an eye towards deployment? Um, so good question, Sherry. I think that uh, if you are um, wanting to be deployed with anybody, I think you're going to have to go and go through their sort of, everybody kind of has their little rigmarole, you know, little things that they want you to do, the little trainings they want you to, that you, they want you to attend. Um, some of them are going to be um, carrier certifications that if you get it, if, if you get the carrier certification at Crawford, it counts at Pilot and it counts at Alacrity and it counts at Everill and whoever. Um, but they may also have like pilots got their claims college. Part of that is to kind of get you calibrated to the pilot sort of system as well as get a gauge of what you know so that they can sort of classify you as somebody who's, you know, they can use right away or that may need some help with other things, right? Maybe you need to, to work on your Xactimate skills or you need to work on whatever, right? So the, a lot of those trainings are um, part training, part assessment of you, right? So anything outside of a carrier certification. Um, if you're wanting to, <clears throat> excuse me, maximize your, your opportunities for deployment, then I would say go to as many as you can. Um, some of them, most of them are free. If they're not free, they should be really low cost. I think, uh, I don't know, Crawford's got, do they have one or some where they like you pay a little bit and then they reimburse you later yeah. kind of deal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So there's there's a lot of options there. Um, but I would, I would strongly recommend if you want to work with, if you want to be, it, it, in line to work claims for any of those companies, then you need to go through when if they tell you to go to claims college or to go to the ABCs thing or to go to the whatever, whatever it is, just go. Right. Um, it's it's worth it. And usually the, the, the cost is minimal if there is one. But that's a good question. Um, you want to, you know, do you want to maximize your opportunities for deployment? Um, and that's that's a really good way to do it because you, they're not going to send you out without you having done th gone through their thing, especially pilot, and without you having gone through their little things. But the other thing that you can do to, to maximize your your deployment opportunities is to get more licenses. You know, we always talk about this. Licenses are are kind of the key to opening new opportunities in different parts of the country because. Um, again, like we were talking about previously, I feel like um, I firms these days have everybody in electronic database, right? The roster, and it'll have information about you, your experience level, what licenses you have, what certifications you have, what trainings you have. And th they may say, hey, we've got an event in Virginia and we need people with a Virginia license. Which I'm not sure if Virginia has a license or not, but we'll say that they do. They've got to have a Virginia license first of all. So that's the first thing. If you don't have a Virginia license, you're not going to show up in any of the rest of the searches. They're not going to be like, oh, well, then we also have Sherry. She doesn't have a Virginia license, but she's got, you know, exactly level two. 
it doesn't matter. You got to have the license, right? In order to even open up the door for you to work in Virginia, and then you need to tick off the rest of the boxes. Um, so I strongly recommend that you guys put time and effort into and resources into getting your state as many state adjuster license as you can, um, because those they may have opportunities where there's nobody else available or nobody else licensed to go work in New Hampshire or to go work in Seattle, right? Something that's totally, or Alaska, you know, I don't know that there's a whole bunch of adjusters living in Alaska. Maybe they get a big earthquake it's in, near, a, you know, a metro area and there's tons and tons and tons of damage. Um, a lot of people are going to be trying to get their Alaska license, but if you've already got it, you're on a plane to Alaska and you're boots on the ground first, right? Um, which is significant. Um, the difference, and this is this is actually a, a good point, because um, when I first started my career, um, I, you know, honestly, I always made a point when they called and they said, hey, Matt, we need to go to St. Louis, we need to go to wherever. I was like, okay. And I would jump on my truck, like that after, if it was at two o'clock in the afternoon, I get this call, I'll jump in my truck and get started on the drive and I might get halfway there or three hours on the way there. And then I can finish the rest of the trip on the next day. But when I got there first, the, the, the faster I got on site, the faster I was able to, to close a few claims, right? Like, in, I don't know if you, I'm sure I've said it, but what I'll usually do is I'll, I'll uh, set one, two, or three appointments in the afternoon. Like I might roll into town at 11 o'clock in the morning and then set up two appointments for the afternoon and just to kind of go and get a feel for what kind of damage we're dealing with and to get me calibrated with file review, right? Because I'm going to turn those in that that evening and file review will have time to, to look at them. They won't be swamped with anybody else's claims because I'm the first person turning claims in. They'll look at them and say, hey, Matt, uh, you forgot to use this. Uh, hey, Matt, uh, we're actually using this form or this whatever it is, right? This new header um, or your notes are wrong. We're doing a different thing with the notes. And I, they get me calibrated. And then once I get that, then I'm off to the races. Um, and I'll have claims closed before anybody else does, which means that I'll be ahead of them when new claims come in and I'm going to get those new claims, right? They're going to come to me first because I'm being more, I'm more productive just by being there a day early or two days early. So I know people that'll be like, and I never understood why they did. I mean, I guess I understand to a certain degree, but they would get called on Friday and the person would say, they'll say always, you've got 24 hours to get there, right? You can get pretty much anywhere in the country. Well, depending on where you live, you can get most places in the country in 24 hours um, in your vehicle, unless you're Kenneth and you live in Alaska. Um, but he would, this guy would, he'd be like, uh, you know, I'll just, I'm, I'm, I was planning on going out, you know, it's my friend's birthday tonight. We were going to go to the bar, goes to the bar, sleeps in on Saturday, maybe, you know, gets his claims and makes some phone calls on Saturday. And then maybe Sunday we'll leave or, or we'll leave Sunday afternoon and get in Monday night. Right. And then doesn't have his first appointment until Tuesday or even Wednesday. Whereas if I leave immediately, I'm doing I'm doing inspection Sunday afternoon and I probably got 18 claims closed by the end of the day on Wednesday. Right. And he has zero or maybe a couple. So it's it's not an insignificant thing to when they say jump or they say go, you go up to like that minute. Right. Kiss your wife on the cheek and run out the door. Um, so. I'm not sure exactly what I was talking about. Oh, you know, having to, having a license and then getting there as quickly as possible. So it's kind of a, it was a little bit of a tangent, but Sherry, there's not a way to research where our current cat deployments are, other than looking at the weather, uh, uh, or other than knowing the the general um, generally where things happen. Um, at certain times of the year, right? So if if there are current CAD deployments, um, by the time you get your license, those will be over. So you're not gonna, you'll be behind the eight ball the whole time. So my advice 
is to um, get all the licenses between Colorado, which doesn't have a license, but it, but from that line, and I'll show you. I'll show you a picture here. Um, So if you go to adjusterpro.com and go down to, uh, let's see. The resources, uh, the reciprocity map here. This will show you the whole country. Is it possible to? All right. What's your? What's the other way? There you go. Let's go back up one. Okay. So between Colorado, right? So everything. So Montana, Wyoming. I would pick up. Try to pick up Arizona, New Mexico, from the Rockies, basically, all the way over to. Um, Ohio, right, which doesn't have a license, but everything inside of that box. And then from basically Mexico to Canada. If you can, if you, if you, if you're got limited resources and you're like, well, I can't get every single license, but I can get a lot of them. The, the biggest bang for your buck is going to be pretty much everything from Arizona to North Carolina and then just go straight north from from that and get all those licenses. You'll notice that the the light colored Virginia does not have a license. Um, but everything that's light colored does not have an, an adjust state adjuster license. Right. But Minnesota does. And Minnesota is a critical one to get. It's a it's a big deal license. Um, but Colorado doesn't Kansas, Nebraska, South Carolina or South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, Wisconsin. Tennessee, Ohio doesn't have one. PA doesn't have one. New Jersey doesn't have one. Um, but all these other states do, right? So I would, I would get everything from across the whole bottom half of the bottom of the uh, country, and then Minnesota, Wyoming, Montana, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan. That'd be that'd be my strategy. Um, you, it, Honestly, I would get a, get the, every license you can if if you're able to get all 34 of them. You know, so Hawaii and Alaska both have licenses as well. Um, but that would be my strategy for getting for doing licensing. Um, you know, so you can't exactly say, all right, well, where are the cats currently? And then I'll just plan around that. You can't really do that. But what you can do is you can say, well, I know that in um, Starting in March, April, that Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Florida, blah, 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 et cetera, all this, this Georgia, um, those places start to get hail storms and wind storms um, starting in, in, in early in the spring storm season. And then that, that wave kind of moves its way up as you go through into June, right? So Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, Indiana, Michigan, North North Dakota, South Dakota, those places will all get monster hail. It's as big a hail as you can get in Texas, you can get in Minneapolis. Okay, um, so don't think it's only a southern thing or only a Midwest thing or whatever. It's all the way up, even into Canada, like well into Canada. Um, so I would that that would be my strategy is to say, all right, well, right now it's it's the middle of May and stuff's going to happen. Still, we're still we're not at the peak of of the spring storm season yet. I'm going to try to get all these licenses all in the middle of the country, for sure. And then having those licenses from North Carolina all the way over to Texas, including Florida, will cover you for hurricane season, right? And then up the coast, New York, I'd get New York too, no matter what. Yeah, it's expensive to get all those licenses. Um, 
So that's why I say, you know, if, you, if you're if you're not able to just like you don't have quite the checkbook to get every single license, then I would focus on you could even just start at Texas and go over to North Carolina and then pick up Minnesota and Indiana and Kentucky. And that'd be a good that'd be a really good start. Um, it, later in the year, in the wintertime, fall, winter, I'm going to look at, you know, or late summer even. You got wildfires out west, you know, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, um, California. I would get a California license for sure because it's, you know, 38 million people, 40 million people live there. That's more than the population of Canada. Oregon and Washington get wildfires every year. Montana gets wildfires. Um, every single year, lots and lots of damage. Um, but in the wintertime, big storms, big winter storms, three feet of snow. You know, so you get weight of ice and snow in Oregon, Washington. You also get that over here in New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, um, so on and so forth. So, again, getting every license is probably the best, the, 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 in the long run, is the best strategy. But if you can't, if you can't do it, you know, right now, then I would I would pick and choose. I would focus on the the southeast and the upper Midwest, and then try to pick up the northeast and the northwest, and grab the big states, California and New York. Good question. Don't worry about the California experience requirement. That's not a thing. I know it says it on the application, but you just click that you have it and move on. It's not. Um, it's a I was told by a reliable source that it's a it's not something that they audit. They don't, they're not going to be checking, and even if they did, that they count lateral experience, um, related experience, and many 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 things can be related experience to claims or to insurance work, including construction, which you have, Sherry, and uh, customer service, which retail bars and restaurants. You know, all that stuff, to my mind, counts because you're dealing with customers, right? Customer satisfaction, and that's the core of what we do. So don't let that stop you from getting a California license. Just just go ahead and get it. What else we got? Any other questions? Good questions, by the way. Good questions. Um, while you guys are thinking, um, I think, uh, you know, d don't forget that you can, you know, during if, you, if you're sitting here and you're like, I can't think of anything, I'm just kind of putting you on the spot. Um, but if later today or anytime during the week at all, um, it's, something pops in your head and you have a question about, you know, whether it's in Xactimate or it's in the, if you're still taking the FTD thing or you have a question about the test or whatever, um, post it up in the group and um i try to get in there uh once or twice a day or every other day um, to look at things and see if anybody has questions and, and we can answer those questions and i can go in depth and andy can go in depth and exactimate um if you you know if you post it up in the group then we can see it when you think about it just be like okay let me jump in the in the app and post that in there other people will answer for, you know, answer the questions. And then we can, if it's something that we think that we could make a training out of, basically, then we can add it to this. Um, give you guys a couple of minutes to think about it. So while I have you guys here, um, question. Just give me a show of hands or like a thumbs up or whatever um, in the chat. 
if we had, um, say we had a house and um, we were going to do, we could do like a hands-on scoping and construction training at this house. Would you be interested in that if it was like a two, maybe four day, something like that kind of a training? Or even maybe one day. Or one day, you know, just like a little, like a like an intensive boot camp kind of a deal. Get a sure. We got a yes. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine anybody being like, nah, I don't, that doesn't sound like it's. Basically, it's a, you get a practice run, what, what it amounts to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, that's something we've been kind of talking about and kicking around. And, and uh, I don't know that it's going to, it's not going to be next week or anything, but um, probably towards, Later in the summer, maybe early fall, mid fall. Um, that's something that we can probably get get up and running. Um, Would anybody have a problem climbing a ladder and getting on a roof? Part of the training would maybe be ladder safety, how to get on and how to get on and off a roof safely, how to set your ladder up, how to carry the ladder um inspection process i'm a big fan of i don't don't get me wrong i like telling people how to do the job but i'm a big fan of showing people how to do the job so i think uh the best way i've learned is standing shoulder to shoulder with somebody on a roof or in a house that's been torn up and uh getting some hands-on experience and Kind of what we're leaning towards is you have a house that ha actually has damage on it. It's not occupied, so you don't have to worry about the homeowners. Um, so you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get a house with actual damage. Maybe you have a room with a flood cut and you walk in there and like, holy crap, what did I get myself into? Well, you have that oh crap moment in this in this house. Um, that isn't you're not on the front line, so to speak, you get to kind of practice and get your feet wet in a house that has damage. Um, and then when you get into that house that has all that damage, you're not so shell shocked, if you will. Yeah. Water claims are my weak area. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, and they can get they can get sticky. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of moving parts to, especially to water claims, fire claims are the same way where you have, you know, some sort of a substance, whether it's smoke or heat or water that just touch whenever, whatever it touches gets ruined or damaged in some way. And do you, do you repair it? Do you try to save it or do you throw it away? You rip it out and throw it away. Um, those are, those are big question marks. But the good news with that is that there's certain little gateways, right? That you can say, well, the water came from the sewer backed up through the sewer system into the house. Anything that that water touches is gonna, you're gonna tear it out, throw it away. You're not just gonna try and dry it out and save it, right? But if it was um, water from the sink overflowing, then maybe you would think about if it was just clean water, maybe you could dry that out and save stuff. Um, yeah, so origin and cause of loss and estimate reconciliation, you know, <clears throat> the, the thing about, I don't know, water claims, they can be, they can be big and they can be, you know, um, they can get really, really, really big. But the thing about it is, is that it's house is mostly air, right? It's, it's a box and it's, it's made of, you know, interior finishes, some structure to hold everything up and then exterior finishes. And that's pretty much it, right? Some insulation and some electrical running on the walls. Um, so you, it's not like it's 
um, rebuilding the engine in a 747, right, with all kinds of little tubes and wires and stuff and things going everywhere, and it's going to explode if you twist the wrong thing. Um, it's it's a box, right? When we talk about origin and cause of loss, the more familiar the more familiar you are with the policy, uh, the more that becomes the much easier question to answer, right? So in other words, um, if the water is coming through a crack in the wall on the foundation, if you don't know anything about the policy, then you're not going to know if that's covered or not, right? But if you are familiar with the policy um, and you've taken some training on it or you just, I mean, even just reading the policy, you could probably figure out um, that the crack, water coming through the crack in the wall, not covered. Right. So you, that's claim basically denied. You're going to spend time trying to figure out if that's actually the source of the water or if it was in someplace else, a floor drain or maybe a toilet downstairs or something, a plumbing burst pipe or whatever it is. Some other thing that would be covered. You're hunting around looking in closets and, you know, whatever, trying to find something that could extend coverage. You're always trying to look to find a way to extend coverage. Um, and I don't know. Any company, that, there's no company I've ever worked for that was like, you know, uh, whenever possible, look for ways to not pay for damage. It's, nobody's ever said that. I don't think you've had that experience. Even with, even with State Farm, believe it or not. Like find uh, a way to pay the claim. Find a way to pay the, for the claim, right? Because that makes, because if you don't and you could and you, and you can't, you could have paid for it, that, that opens up to a much, much greater expenses for the insurance company in the form of lawsuits, losing the customer. Right. Um, public adjusters, appraisal, arbitration. I mean, it just, it just it starts to snowball into a big mess. So you do it, everything that you possibly can to, to have the mindset. I'm going to try to find a way to pay for this. And if you can't, then that's when it gets denied. It's not that you you look at the loss report. This happens all the time, all the time. Look at the loss report. And when the insured called in, they said, um, that the they the water came in through the wall and filled the basement, right? And I, I use this example all the time. Um, if you look at that and you're like, oh, that's not going to be covered, and you make your phone call and you're and you're, some people will say, you know, when because the, they'll ask, be like, well, you know, tell me where the water came. In. Well, I'm pretty sure the water came in through the the crack in the wall. You know, uh, water always comes in through that crack, and it was if the basement was full of water, and I saw, you know. Um, old pictures and you know kids dolls and whatever floating around in the water downstairs i just didn't go down there right the adjuster may make up their mind about the claim before they ever get there and actually investigate the claim go to that claim right and then the the insurer the, the adjuster doesn't even go downstairs they really go downstairs and they take a picture of the spot where the, the homeowner says they think the water came in deny the claim and then leave it's possible right that maybe the homeowner didn't go downstairs and look. And if they had, they would have seen water gushing up out of the floor drain in the, the utility room, right? Which would be covered, you know, maybe in this circumstance for the have endorsement or whatever. Um, so you, it's up to you as the adjuster to investigate the claim and to give the insured the benefit of the, of the doubt so that they could never say the adjuster had their mind made up before they even came out to the house, which is, Carriers, that's it's, it's the worst possible thing that a, a customer can say about their adjuster. It's terrible. It's just, your customer service numbers will be in the tank. Um, but it's, and as far as you know, recon, estimate reconciliation, that is as simple as it's. It's a little bit intimidating because if you're like, all right, I wrote this estimate. And then I'm looking at the contractor's estimate. And a lot of contractors use Xactimate. So you're gonna, it's going to be, you can almost go line for line, right? Um, he, his estimate's $45,000. Yours is $25,000, right? What do I do? I mean, I'm scared. I don't know. I, th I thought I wrote everything that I possibly could. Well, what I would do, I'm printing both of those out. And I'm going to go through that, the, take a red pen and go through the contractor's thing and look for all the things that I, I know I can't pay for, right? I know they don't have, <clears throat> excuse me, not on the house and they don't, there's no cut upgrade for it. 
ice and water shield, right? That might add two thousand twenty five hundred dollars to a claim, right? I'm making a red line through that on the contractor's estimate. I'm going to go through and find all the things. He's got starter's trip. I can't pay for it, right? Like because it's included in the waste. It's the estimating guidelines policy. I don't care what social media says. I don't care what GAF says. I don't care what anybody says. If my rules say I can't pay for starter and ridge because it's included in the waste, I just can't pay for it, right? Red line goes to those things, okay? Um, so on and so forth. So I'm going to go through and red line a bunch of stuff and then add those things up. And I might, you know, they had $45,000. And after they're all the red lines, which there may or may not be that many, right? Maybe it's down to 37, all right? But I'm still at 25. Well, I'm going to look through there, his estimate again, maybe with a different color pen and be like, what are the things I left out of my estimate that I know I, I, he's got in his and I could, I could put in mine. And, and it's not in the estimating guidelines, right? It's something I'm like, well, I'm missing it in mine. Find those things. And then maybe I'm going to kind of do an assessment of, you know, if it's a roof claim, how accessible is that roof? You know, is it two and a half stories on the front with great big tree, trees hanging over the, the front, some, some columns, it's a, some sort of, you know, like deep south sort of looking place but they have to go all the way around to the back in order to even access the roof. And they can't, they can't preload the, the shingles up on the roof because there's too many trees in the way. Um, the guys are going to have to, you know, the closest they can get is 50 yards away. And the, 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 the in, install techs are going to have to haul that stuff by hand up there. I'm adding a couple thousand bucks for access, right? So my, my estimate can kind of creep up, right? Just doing that. So I'm not going to call cold without doing this and, and try to negotiate with the contractor. I'm going to do a bunch of homework beforehand. I'm going to redline it out the things that I know I absolutely cannot pay for under any circumstance. If they really, really, really want them, they're going to have to take it up the chain, right? But I'm not having philosophical debates with contractors about whether or not, you know, starter and just don't, you, you can't engage in that conversation. You can't, don't argue with them about it because there's zero that you can do about it. If they say you can't pay for it, you can't pay for it. Don't pay for it. Let the, you know, let it escalate. If, it, if it's a guy who wants to absolutely fight you on it, um, it's not a big deal. My hands are tied. I just can't do it. Right. But I can pay for these other things. Right. So you're doing a little bit of a negotiation. Um, you're doing a little bit of back and forth. Um, cut out the things you can't pay for. Look for way, things in his estimate that you may have missed. Maybe you just, you know, I'm not super great at writing estimates for whatever the thing is. And he's got like a really detailed estimate and a bunch of line items in his thing. I'm going to kind of crib off of his and put it in mine. What I'm after ultimately is that bottom line number, right? He's got 45. <clears throat> I get him knocked down to 35. I get mine from 25 up to 32. Now we're in striking distance, right? We're in a couple thousand dollars of each other. And that's where we can be like, Hey, listen, this is where we're at. You know, uh, we can maybe figure out, you know, have a conversation with that's where I'm going to, at that point, that's where I'm going to take it and have a conversation and be like, Hey, what else, where else can we find some, some ground where maybe I can kind of meet up with you and maybe you can kind of come down and meet me. Maybe we can kind of split the difference between those $1,500 up here, $1,500 on mine and then call it even, right. We get that agreed scope and pricing. Um, not that hard. Um, it's intimidating when you first do it because you feel like, you don't know what you're talking about, a little imposter syndrome, right? And they're an expert or supposedly, um, but, you know, it's if, if you do the homework beforehand, before you start trying to, to make that phone call to negotiate, um, you'll be in a much better position to say, all right, well, I know I can, I can goose mine up on these, but he has to, he has to, I just can't pay for those, those things. And you'll find that there's a lot of things in a contractor's estimate that the estimating guidelines won't let you pay for, or their upgrades that the homeowner wants. They've got a three tab roof on, the, on their house and they want wood shake. You're not paying for wood shake, you're paying for three tab, right? That's a lot of money, that's a huge difference. And that may be all the difference, right? The homeowner just wants an upgrade and boom, you're done, right? So if you, if you take the time to look through the estimate and make sure it's apples to apples, um, you'll be okay. Don't be afraid of, of, of negotiating with contractors just be prepared to do some homework before you get on the phone with them so that you don't get caught flat-footed. Make sense? Really good question. 
Yeah, that's the other thing, too, is uh, understanding the repair process will make you more comfortable. Yeah. So um, the contractors, by and large, they are the experts, but it doesn't matter. If you know how they're going to repair something, then they it doesn't matter if they're the expert. You know how it's going to be repaired. Let me give you an example. So you have a small drywall area that needs to be cut out. It's a six by six area or six inch by six inch area. And they put on their, their supplement, that they need to use the uh, texture gun, air, air compressor. They need to mask everything and all this stuff. Well, for a spot that small, they're just going to use a texture texture sponge. They're not going to use their texture gun, which requires air pressure. And so you don't need to mask off all the walls and ceiling for that because they're just going to sponge it and then do their knockdown texture. Now, if it's a it's a five foot by five foot area, then they're not going to use a sponge on that. They're going to come in there with their texture hopper and spray that area to blend it in and it uses air pressure and so that stuff's going to get everywhere so then it would make sense to include some uh viz queen or some masking walls ceilings floor then that would be okay understanding that repair process makes you better because it doesn't matter if they're the experts you know how it's going to uh, be repaired and so that's part of it too it's just knowing um how to write the estimate yes but how it's going to be repaired that's going to help you guys tremendously as well yeah for sure the more knowledge and education that you have the better um you know don't let your education stop with the fast track program keep keep getting keep educating yourself keep getting training and that's why i would say even if it seems like it's rep repetitious go to those i firm trainings First, 100%, um, because, you know, the more you see this stuff, the more it gets in there, you'll start to fill in the holes that, you know, my, my training is pretty specific and in, in, in relatively narrow with the guardrails kind of keeping you on a narrow path. But there are other little places that, you know, you may be able to fill in some of the holes, right? Um, so Sherry says, if, if you have, well, I have a lot of water, though. Uh, and then there's a whole subrogation piece. Don't worry, subrogation is not something you're going to deal with on CAT. Um, it's something you deal with a lot on daily, um, but it's a matter of usually appliances, right, that break. Or it's like, well, the refrigerator, the water thing busted and it caused all this water damage to the floor. The dishwasher thing busted and it caused all this water damage to the floor. That's when you get a subrogation situation, generally speaking. Um, there's a, there's other situations, you know, but they're not nearly as common as those on daily cat. Almost never. I can't think of a, a really can't think of anything as you're going to deal with subrogation on a cat. Um, so if a roof has tree damage, it affects the structural integrity. Maybe do you call an engineer report or just estimate worst case? <laughs> um, so I wouldn't estimate worst case. You can only estimate what you can see uh, reasonably, but you may throw a two foot or a three foot level in your kit. And, you know, for hail storms and things like that, um, usually no, but if, if a tree, I would just just throw one in your in your bin and just put it have it in the back of your truck. Um, because if you go to a house and, <clears throat> and you see that there's a, tr a big tree, I mean it takes a you know a big chunky heavy tree really leaning into the side of the house, and you're gonna if there's damage to framing, generally speaking, it's not going to be a little bit. It's going to be a lot, right? So it's going to the wall the 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 joints where the drywall comes together in corners and and the ceiling and the wall or whatever it, it's going to be popped open ripped out be tear down the wall um it'll be pretty obvious and then you'll be able to, to look in there with your flashlight and see that the studs aren't lined up right they're they're because they just got pushed out by the tree you know then you're paying for framing and that's that's a pretty easy that's a pretty easy <clears throat> um but if you have a situation where 
And I think I had one like this on Hurricane Katrina, where a big tree kind of leaned over and sort of pushed into the side of the house, and it kind of racked the whole thing a little bit. Um, there were, again, there were little tears and stuff along where the seams on the drywall were, along the, where the roof and the wall meet, right? Um, and then if you take your level and put it up against the wall, it was like the bubble was off to one side because they were off a little bit. Um, that's a situation where, you know, again, you're not writing worst case scenario because the worst case scenario is you tear the whole house down. Um, and in those situations, it may be that you, um, that the house can, you know, once a tree's off, the house will kind of pop back to where it's supposed to be. And there was nothing really was damaged. There weren't any, you know, didn't pull a bunch of nails out and it didn't cause a, a lot of extensive damage except for on that one side. Um, and then you can just like, you know, remud and whatever the drywall and then repaint everything. Um, but if it's, if it's pretty bad, um, then you may be talking about pulling the drywall off and seeing if there's things that are broken. You're not going to pull the drywall off, but you might be writing an estimate to remove and replace drywall. Um, typically, um, in any event, you're, you're going to try to write for, write it as extensively as you can based on what you can see. And if it's a repair to start, and this is what I would make clear to the homeowner, um, and so we'll use this as an example, the, you know, the tree leaning on the side of the house and it kind of racks everything a little bit and there's little cracks and they, they look fresh. It's not clearly not from like settling where it's like stair step cracks or they're, you know, at the, the, the corners of doors and things like that. It's from, you know, you can see like fresh pieces of drywall material and stuff on the floor right below the little, the, the little tears and stuff. From, and it's, you know, everything's going away from where the tree hit. Um, write a repair for that stuff and then let the homeowner know, um, hey, listen, once you once your contractor gets into this, if they determine that there is more damage, if there is more extensive framing damage that we just can't see because we can't take the whole house apart to look, um, then call us back and let us know and we'll get with the, we'll get with them and make sure that we're everybody's on the same page with what it, it's we should pay to get this all fixed up correctly. May or may not involve an engineer, right? Um, engineers, usually it's where there's a, uh, dispute, right? Where, um, the, the homeowner or the contractor is, is saying that there's some kind of damage that is, you don't think is caused by a covered cause of loss, but they do maybe because they just want it or they're not educated very well, or you're wrong it's possible. Um, then you might, you know, you're going to run that up the chain. You're not going to say ever, never, never to any homeowner. Well, we're, we're going to get an engineer and da, 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 da. don't ever say that. You just say, um, you collect all your information, say, I think I have everything I, I need. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this back to the office and start working on my report and I'll consult with my management and we'll, um, you know, I'll be in touch and let you know what we'll come up with. Right. That's it. And then I would go to my manager and I would say, um, these guys think it's this. I don't think it is. Um, they may just say, just deny it, right? And just send them a letter saying that, that it's based on our investigation. It's not consistent with hail damage or with whatever damage and let it escalate on its own, right? There's another process that you're not involved with, like the appraisal appraisal process. You're not going to be involved with that. If they, chose to, if they choose to invoke that, then that's when the engineers and things like that get involved. Um, but there are other circumstances where you might you might have an engineer that gets involved um, on a claim. Um, and I'm trying to think it's the daily claims, maybe um, where you're trying to make a determination of whether the wind blew on the I had one in Tri-Cities. Um, the guy's fence, he had a wood, uh, not wood, it was a like a concrete block wall, like a privacy wall. Um, and it was leaned over and he was convinced that it was caused by wind. And I was looking at it and I was like, I don't know, this looks like, you know, there's a, he didn't have any grass or landscaping in the backyard. He was doing a bunch of work back there and there was all these big ruts from the water running out. And I was like, probably from this surface water and it's just, it's, that, that's not covered. And we ended up getting an engineer on it because the guy was adamant, um, about it and. 
I can't remember what the engineer said, but you know, don't be going around telling people that you're going to that you're going to get be getting engineers um, because that's you want to you want to leave the carrier and the IA firm as many options as possible um, about how to handle a certain situation because you know if you get some other eyes on it, you get your manager's eyes on it or a QA person, maybe they may say. Oh, well, it's this, right? It's we don't need to get an engineer. It's just a whatever. But if you run around saying, you know, well, we have to get an engineer. We, you know, I, it's not that. We're going to get an engineer, and they're going to be on our side, and they're going to prove it me right and whatever. Don't just don't do that. And by the same token, if you go up on somebody's roof and you see what you're pretty convinced that is you know, like hammer hail, or somebody takes a ball peen hammer. Or I mean, they take all kinds of things, and usually it's pretty obvious. Um, and they put a bunch of little marks and holes and whatever on the roof. Um, do not, do not go back down and tell the homeowner that they have a uh, hammer hail on the roof and that they need to file a claim for vandalism and all this kind of stuff. Do not say, do not say that. This is what you say. Um, because guaranteed, I, I think in of all the times I've ever seen hammer hail, the contractor conveniently doesn't show up for the appointment. They just don't want to be there because they're, they, they're, they're breaking the law. It's fraud. Um, and they're, they'll generally try to distance themselves. Um, one time I did two times I did and I was, they were sweating bullets. Anyway, um, don't say there's hammer hail on your roof. I can't believe your roof is destroyed from a guy like beating up with it on a hammer. It was somebody else up there, you know, it might have been the homeowner that did it. Who knows? This is what I would say. I would say, um, hey, just want to let you know um, that I did. There was nothing on your roof that was consistent with hail damage. Um, there's no hail damage on your roof, and your policy, you know, is, covers hail damage. Um, I have all the photos and measurements and everything that I need. I'm going to take this back to the office and put together a report and give you a call. Right. And then you're out. Don't be, the, well, we, you know, we, do you think it's, it's total or is not? Uh, I have everything I need. Just let me, I'm going to run back to the office and we'll get, we'll get this put together and, you know, and then leave. Right. And just get out of there. Um, the, the funniest part about all that is that half the time there's real hail damage on the roof already. And for some reason they thought the guy really was convinced he had to just go back up there with the hammer and make sure that you saw all the spots that he was making, even though there's hail damage on it. And if that's the case, just pay for the roof. But don't tell the homeowner that they have, they need to file a vandalism claim. Don't tell them anything other than, don't commit the insurance company to anything is, is basically what I'm saying. Jump in the, the car. First thing I would do is call my manager on my, on my way to my next one. Hey, listen, I just got off one. It looks like it looks like hammer hail. And I, I probably took a bunch of photos with my phone and texted them to him anyway. Um, what do you want me to do? What are they what what should we do in this situation? Right. And let them decide what to do about it. Because they may say, well, we'll just pay for it and then and then cancel them. Right. That's I've had that happen before. Um, or they may say, call the homeowner back and tell them to file a vandalism claim. Or or, you know, thanks for gathering this information. Um, you know, go ahead and turn it in, put your invoice on it, and we'll send it over to SIU and let them deal with it, right? But don't, don't be talking about engineers, don't be talking about vandalism claims because you don't want to commit the insurance company to, uh, to something that they, they may want to do differently, right? So less talking is better. Make sense? Well, uh, we'll wrap this thing up and catch you guys next week. Adjuster TV. Don't try this at home.